Well, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Marianella Dupile. I'm a Chicago-based uh, writer, architecture critic. We're all gathered here to celebrate uh, this very exciting new book, Critique of Architecture by Doug. Um, if everyone doesn't have it, you should get a copy. I just saw someone drop in the chat that you can buy it for a discount. It's beautiful. It's got this lovely spine and obviously the content is great too. Um, I, um, yeah, I mean, speaking of that, I think, you know, I was just thinking today, actually, Doug, I found this book to be a very, very ti timely and maybe accidentally timely contribution as I think so many people in the architectural world are trying to grapple with this very complicated and politically charged moment. I think there's a lot of questions in front of us about what the role of architecture is, um, but also what the role of the architecture critic is in in bringing light to that, and if there is a role um, for for uh, for critique. Um, and so, um, so I think it's it's very very timely in that way. And I think for me personally, in my own work, it has pushed me to uh, sort of start to look looking beyond, um, you know, architecture, just spectacle and really taking in the political and the economic context that actually take into account production and labor. Um, so I'm very excited to get to talk with all of you today. Um, our program is gonna be an hour and a half. Um, so we'll start with Doug himself introducing the book and then we'll have comments from Will Orr Ricardo Rivo and Eleni Xioti, and then we'll have a discussion. So if you have um, questions that are, you know, coming up for you, you can put them in the chat and I'll be watching the chat. Um, I guess you could also send them directly to me, but it's good for everyone to see them. So I think just put them in the, in the regular chat. Um, so I'll introduce um, our interlocutors today. So first we have, Will Orr, um, who is a British Canadian theorist and historian based in London. Um, in 2019, Will completed a PhD at the AA, where he teaches now in the History and Theory program. And he uses a historical materialist framework in his research that examines the interplay between political and architectural theory from the 60s to the present. So very much in line with what we're talking about today. Uh, Ricardo is a Portuguese architect, researcher, and teacher at the AA, um, where he also completed his PhD. His work focuses on the tensions between architectural form and political content in architectural discourse, and on contemporary problems internal to the rising effort toward a repoliticization of architecture. Always very hard to, or hard to say. Um, and finally, uh, last but not least, we have Eleni Exioti, who is a researcher and educator. Um, she is a lecturer in contextual studies at the University of the Arts in London and teaches history and theory of architecture at the AA. She completed her PhD at the AA on the dissolution of the architecture of the British welfare state. And her work focuses on the architectural history in regard to issues of government, social policy, and political economy. And then we have, of course, Doug Spencer, who is Pickard Chilton Professor and Director of Graduate Education at Architecture at Iowa State University. He is also the author of Architecture of Neoliberalism and then, of course, of Critique of Architecture, which is why we're all here today. Um, and he's written for a number of um, publications, including Log, Eflux, uh, New Geographies, and Volume. Um, I have had the pleasure um, and absolute privilege of knowing Doug now for a few years, and just truly cannot imagine writing about politics and architecture without his influence in the field, more broadly, um, but also on my own thinking personally. Um, so Doug, without any further ado, I'll let you take it away and introduce the book. Thank you very much, Marinella. So, so firstly, um, yeah, I just want to say I, um, I really appreciate that introduction. Um, and I, I really appreciate that you and 
Will, Eleni, and, and Rick joining me for this event. Um, that means a lot to me. And it's nice to involve people on both sides of the Atlantic, kind of um, old and new friends and comrades. Um, I also want to thank Andrew for uh, inviting me to to, hold, to have this event and for hosting it and to, and to the AA, of course, as well, um, for hosting it. Um, the, uh, the the publishers, Balbert Fundamento, I want to thank uh, Angela Kushnell, who I think is with us, and from Burkhauser uh, for the kind of project management of this, Katerina Kolka. Um, big shout out to Neil Brenner for kind of talking me into doing this um, and for making sure that it happened. For David uh, Cunningham's really generous introduction um, and for being such a great interlocutor for, for many years since he was my PhD supervisor and to Milos Kosec, um, another long-term interlocutor who provided the, the interview and the, and the questions for that with which the book concludes. So what I'm going to do is spend um, a maximum of 15 minutes reading from part of the introduction to the book, uh, because I think that, uh, among other things, will give us a, a, a sense of, of why I think that looking at critique is, is both a kind of long, deep issue for architecture and for theory in, in general, and why it's especially timely now. Uh, and then I'll just say a few words about the, the structure and the contents of the book. So we are now nearly two decades into the assault on criticality in architecture. The turn to Deleuze, marking the entrance of this assault onto the stage of architecture theory, has itself been succeeded by subsequent turns to affect, to actor networks, to object-oriented ontologies, to the new materialism, and the non-referential. Yet each of these turns insists still on the need to overcome criticality in order to realize the market value of its own shiny new paradigm. As if critique were some ongoing tyrannical regime, some overbearing presence, not only in architecture, but in the world at large. Jeff Kipnis, uh, wrote in 2004 that he wanted to kill criticality once and for all. In order for the post-critical and its descendants to live, however, criticality must, it seems, repeatedly be brought back to life in order only to be killed over and over again. After dying so many deaths, the spectre of critique haunts the world of the living in ever more strange forms. For Mark Foster Gage, it assumes the appearance of Kim Kardashian West. Her performative awareness of political, uh, uh, political concerns is taken by Gage as symptomatic of how, he writes, these critical and awareness-based strategies, like those critical tactics in architecture, no longer cut it. Worse still, for Gage, the entire project of criticality operates from a privileged position of intellectuality from which it looks down condescendingly upon the world. Critical theory from the mid 20th century on, he writes, blanketed architecture, shifting the landscape of modernist optimism into a darker shade of problem infested reality that architecture and its privileged perceivers were tasked with fixing." End of quote. So critical theory is charged by Gage with lowering the otherwise positive tone of the 20th century and for the presumption to suggest that anything needs setting right in the first place. Rather though, rather than the continued and negative reign of the critical, 
what has in fact marked the past 20 years in architectural culture, in some of its more prominent expressions at least, is its positive embrace of market forces. Architects have learned to play by and to profit from the rules of the neoliberal truth game. Discredit any and all attempts to address the problems of the world as elitist and despotic. Demean human capacities for reasoning. Leave everything to the superior calculating powers of the market. Resign oneself to enjoying its products rather than interpreting them. Don't think, feel. Market yourself. Market the market as progressive. Conjuring up the critical as a kind of phantasmagoric figure of oppression, though, also serves to ward off the presence of a counter tendency, the very real and radical politicization of architecture that has taken place in recent years, as Mariella was referring to. Rather than the privilege of the critical theorist, it is that of the white male architect that has been challenged by this counter tendency. As I write, and I was writing this in 2020, uh, in the midst of the uprising in the US, against the ongoing barbarities of structural racism, the funding of the police and the prison industrial complex, architects are exposing their experiences of racism in, a, in professional practice, and students are demanding substantial revisions to the overwhelmingly white and Western dominated nature of architectural education. While the patriarchal nature of the profession has long been called out from feminist historical and theoretical perspectives, this took on even greater significance and urgency in 2018 with architecture's Me Too moment, in which allegations of predatory and sexually abusive conduct on the part of certain male architects were made public. The kind of critical awareness disparaged by Gage and others has been brought to bear in recent years, both on the employment practices of architectural firms and on the conditions under which their projects are constructed. The architecture lobby formed in 2013 so as to challenge the precarity of architectural employment has since gone on to address a number of political, economic, environmental and ethical issues in which architecture is implicated. In 2019, the revelation of the use of unpaid interns by Yunya Ishigame and associates in their Serpentine Pavilion project for London escalated and made further visible these discussions about the terms and conditions under which architecture labor is undertaken. The group who builds your architecture have been engaged in bringing about greater awareness of the circumstances under which architecture is constructed and the Settler Colonial City project seeks in its own words, to rectify the lack of discussion about indigeneity and settler colonialism in architecture and urban studies. All of these initiatives have the goal of not merely of raising awareness as some kind of self-satisfying end in itself, but as playing some part in a larger endeavor to bring about radical change within architecture and the larger world in which it exists. So these are the circumstances to which a critique of architecture must be equal. As Moish Postone reminds us, critical thought and practice is not itself historically indeterminate. And as Ellen Meeksins Wood wrote, the critique of capitalism requires a constantly renewed critique of the analytic instruments designed to understand it. So that's the, the kind of task I've, I've set for myself, or at least to, to start out on. The analytic instruments employed in the critique of architecture are likewise in need of renewal. The essays in this book, accordingly, are not concerned with defending or ratifying critique 
as it might once have been, or as its opponents imagine it to be, but with the development of critique as a contribution to the larger struggles that refuse to accept what is given in neoliberal capitalism. Critique is conceived here as a work of practice, its relation to its object imminent rather than issued from fixed coordinates. It is itself subject to critical analysis in the process of its operation. To express this in the idiom of critical theory itself, critique is simultaneously focused on the labor of the concept and the concrete specificity of its objects. Uh, looking both ways at once, its optic acts in relay between theory and practice, each mobilized to unsettle and rethink the other. Methodologically, the practice of critique presented here is in part a materialist one, but of the old fashioned Marxian and not the new variety, meaning that architecture is accounted for in terms of how it's financed, how it's designed, how it's built in the fulfillment of social, economic and political projects. The materialist analysis of architecture as a site of mediation of and for capitalism is also addressed with reference to the production of subjectivity. As Marx notes in the Grundriss, production in capitalism, he writes, not only creates an object for the subject, but also a subject for the object. Concern with the means and conditions of subjection and with how these are made productive of and for capitalism and power extends, of course, beyond Marx to 20th century critical theory and to Foucauldian modes of analysis. It has been further elaborated in perspectives by Moshe Postone in his rethinking of the basis of critical theory and in ways in which I, I try to develop in at least one of the essays here, and by Sylvia Winter in respect of what she describes as the over-representation of man, of the figure of man, in the Western and colonizing figure of Homo economicus. Addressed and drawn upon in critique of architecture, these approaches are at the same time employed with a consciousness of the need to address the part played by architecture specifically in the production of subjectivity within capitalism. In pursuit of this, critique of architecture addresses how architecture is employed to individuate subjects or else to aggregate them within formations affirming the imaginary of capitalism. It addresses how circulation patterns accommodate subjects to certain modes of behavior, how architecture produces proximities instrumental to new forms of living and working. Architecture is conceived and analyzed as a medium through which habits can be formed and broken, through which attention can be focused or dispersed, through which the subject can be directly addressed or treated with indifference. Opposed to the conventions of treating architecture merely as representative of capitalism, critique of architecture is premised on the analysis of architecture as a medium for its operations. So I just want briefly to share my screen with you and just very, very quickly outline the the kind of tripartite structure which is already indicated in the, the title, Essays on Theory, Autonomy and Political Economy. Uh, so there's a forward by David Cunningham. The first section in part returns to um, an earlier published essay, uh, Architectural Deleuzeism, which is now a vintage of, of 10 years old from radical philosophy. But then I also look at the what I see to be the kind of correlations between environmental design of the, the 60s and, and 70s with neoliberal principles, drawing on some of that work from Sylvia Winter and, and addressing 
some of the the, the issues I, I find in the in the work of figures like uh, Ian McHarg uh, and Rainer Bannum, to name just two. And there's also an essay there on a project by Amanda Lovett in Portugal, um, which I take to be exemplary of this, the architectural form of, of producing kind of platforms for the performance of this ideal personification of capital as um, kind of circulating convivial homo economicus. Uh, section two, is where I, I turn to offer a, a kind of critique of critique, if you like, by turning in the first two essays to engage with the um, the argument for autonomy that comes principally from uh, Pierre Vittorio Arelli. Um, and then also look at a kind of proximate argument from Biffo Baradi about his his concerns about the invasion of the subject by technology and i'm proposing that you know perhaps what's actually most concerning is a kind of detachment of technology from human subjectivity and then i also try and ad address the the legacy of the counterculture as a kind of pseudo radical um politics before turning in the final section of the book to look both at uh, what I feel is an issue with existing critical theory and with the the ongoing post-critical, although it might appear in the guise of things like Bruno Latour's actor network theory, I address the issue of periodization in an essay on uh, Detroit and what I call the design of late Fordism and look at uh, ideas about indifference um and transit infrastructure and then try and wrestle somehow with uh, a whole host of figures including Jameson and Guy Debord and Tafuri uh to to make some intervention so that we can kind of move beyond the existing uh base and superstructure model that even those of us who want to be critical of, of architecture and its role of capital are still kind of perhaps burdened with um, before moving to the, the the final section of the book, which is this uh, interview with uh, Milos Kosech. So that's what I wanted to, to say for the moment. I hope that hasn't been overly lengthy, but I'll let someone else have a chance to speak now. Great, Doug, thank you so much. Um, yeah, Will, why don't you go ahead? Thanks, uh, I'm coming through clearly. Great. Yeah, thanks very much, Marianella, and thanks uh, so much to Doug for inviting me to participate. It's wonderful to read your new book and to launch it at the AA where we had so many interesting conversations when you were here about uh, a lot of these same themes and issues. Uh, that you're covering. I think the first thing that struck me about critique of architecture is how it extends and broadens your line of thinking. And we could say your line of critical attack from the previous book, The Architecture of Neoliberalism. Um, in the earlier book, you were dealing primarily with architectural production and discourse that was sort of organically neoliberal, we could say. So more or less at home with the premises of neoliberal ideology. Uh, and I mean, even explicitly and evangelically neoliberal as in the case of Patrick Schumacher. I think while those currents uh, reappear in this book as you've just sort of described, overall the new book interrogates a wider range of discourses exposing not, not only the organic connection between certain kinds of architectural thinking and neoliberal tendencies, but also contradictions within supposedly alternative projects. So I'm thinking especially of the, uh, the critical, uh, nominally critical anti-neoliberal -neo discourses that you cover in section two, uh, but also parts of sections one and three, 
Uh, after all, even uh, the theory of people like Bruno Latour, actor network theory, object oriented object oriented ontology, and so on, they're also employed somehow against things like parametricism. Um, and just as an aside here, uh, if anyone has seen the debate in 2017, I think it was at Texas A&M between Mark Foster Gage and Patrick Schumacher. Uh, it's a kind of an interesting uh, illustration of this. Contrary to expectations, we might all kind of agree and be on Patrick's side of the debate. Uh, Patrick's argument was kind of an anti-imminent argument, maybe. Uh, his argument was that the shift from Deleuze and Guattari to triple O, or new materialism of some sort. Uh, so that's Mark Foster Gage's break from Patrick's own more established position within architectural theory was really just a branding exercise by Mark Foster Gage. Uh, so the only thing that MFG uh, was really offering under the name of these new theories was a new brand. And of course, uh, Mark Foster Gage took great exception to this, but there's something I think fairly uh, crit critically powerful about Schumacher's reading, even if uh, ultimately has an uncritical perspective on neoliberalism. Uh, so in, in the preface that uh, David Cunningham wrote, uh, Cunningham calls our attention to the argument that's embedded in the title of the book itself, which is critique of architecture, as he says, rather than quote, for instance, criticism of architecture, critical architecture, or architecture of critique. Uh, I think, by the way, those books are all out there somewhere. <laughs> Um, but in your book, uh, this quantitative, uh, but also I think qualitative broadening of the critique uh, in this new book is what I think makes it so versatile and powerful in the present moment. But I think with that, it, nece it uh, necessitates some exploration of what this shift means for critical practice itself, which as you described in the, which you're undertaking also in the introduction. So I'd like to explore that a little bit. If we are dealing with a critique of architecture uh, at this sort of structural level, how do you and how do we place it and practice it within and or against uh, architectural institutions, schools like the AA? What sort of positive claims can we make for uh, political change in general, but also for the, for the role of architectural disciplines, the architectural discipline, and even architectural institutions within that change. And I think for all the Tafuri readers out there, this is uh, obviously the famous problem of operativity. Uh, and I think both Ricardo and Eleni are gonna uh, address this point in some respect too, but I wanted to look at it uh, in the next few minutes through the theme of periodization which is to say, how can we situate the critique of architecture in the present historical moment? What kinds of reflections can we make about the turbulent history of critique within the discipline? And what is it about the present, the present moment that makes what I think is this qualitatively more powerful, even ruthless critique, uh, both necessary and possible? And I think the connection between necessity and possibility is crucial. So there are a number of points in the book where you situate yourself and the book historically and take up the, the problem of periodization. In the chapter on Ford, you do it for a specific kind of theory, but uh, throughout the book, you, you are more kind of like doing a methodological periodization of your, of your work. In the, in the introduction, you say, quote, critique is conceived here as a work of praxis, its relation to its object imminent rather than issued from fixed coordinates. It is itself subject to critical analysis in the process of its operation. Again, in chapter one, you say, quote, critique is not immune to history, but is dialectically implicated within it as the imminent grounds for its own possibility. In chapter 11, architecture's abode of production you re-examine the periodizations of your previous book, The, Architectural, uh, the Architecture of Neoliberalism, and sort of re-periodize -period, re the emergence uh, 
of critical as well as post-critical turns in architectural discourse. Uh, so perhaps everything had already become post-critical even in the 1970s when paradoxically criticality was a celebrated value in discourse. Perhaps uh, the change occurred even earlier um, as you following Thompson say in the 1930s when Marxist critique became an academic pursuit uh, rather than one engaged directly in political struggle in for instance, Frankfurt School uh, work. So critique, there, therefore critique looks back on these historical moments from present conditions and redraws uh, the critical line, lines between what is critical, uncritical, uh, and problematic within the perspective of a, of a periodized, historically grounded critique. So what is it about the present that makes it possible to deepen the critique beyond the critical discourses of the past? Uh, I think most obviously there are continuous references precisely to that past within current discourse, within the discourses you're critically examining. Uh, and those references are increasingly politicized within an architectural debate over neoliberalism itself. And we could put Schumacher on one side of that debate maybe, and perhaps Mark Foster Gage or more explicitly, uh, Pierre Vittorio Rally on the other side. Um, given the climate crisis, economic crisis of 2008, the political crises of 2016, and the full spectrum catastrophe that really mounts and exploded in 2020, it seems natural that the mounting disasters of the capitalist order are addressed and contested within architectural discourse. So that's the timeliness, obviously, of this book, uh, but also its relevance to its context, I think. But there's a bit of a, there's a, bit of a critical difference here. Um, through your critique, you uncover actually, uh, and this is specifically in section two, how the debate within architectural discourse uh, often takes an agonistic form only, rather than an antagonistic one. So not, not one premised on uh, victory, transformation, change, but one based on a kind of balance of friend and foe. We could even say, uh, drawing on the previous uh, Schumacher debate example, that that agonism is the agonism of rival brands within the academic market, within the architectural market. So agonism uh, embraces a limit actually that exists within and not against neoliberal capitalism. And I think this is why you uh, ultimately find such discourses unacceptable, both critically and politically. But the, the real challenge, I think, uh, is to reflect this problem back on, on the critique and ask what makes the critique of architecture itself able to surpass that limit? What makes critique uh, more than agonistic? And I think there are hints about your position on this throughout the book, but the most clear expression uh, comes in the interview that closes out uh, the book. Um, among many insightful and I think quite difficult uh, questions, uh, Milos Kosec asks, given the need for new and expanded critical practices today, how would they be affected, uh, impeded maybe even by the worsening precarity and desperation of academic work? Something that I think probably a lot of us uh, have personal experience with, obviously. Uh, after recognizing the tremendously negative effects of this deepening austerity within the academy, your answer makes a dialectical turn to the positive. And this, I think, is the, is the, crucial, the crucial dialectical turn. You say, quote, in terms of the question of the reinvention of critical theory, that because of the, situa because of the situation that many find themselves in, where exploitation and, e and inequality is so much part of everyday lived experience that this act that this mobilizes academics to undertake work relevant to changing these conditions. So it's because of this precarity within neoliberalism that the academy would be more uh, inclined to challenge it. Reflecting on your answer, it seems that critique of architecture is possible today uh, because of processes of subjectivation that are that are happening 
uh, maybe outside the discipline, not necessarily imminent to architecture proper, but there's a subjectivation of the discipline or of some within the discipline uh, that arises from the material political economic base on which the disciplinary superstructure rests. So I'm, I'm also fairly optimistic in some ways about the present crisis of the discipline and about the opportunity for critique, because I see a point where it is increasingly in students and workers' material interests to confront the complicity of architecture and neoliberalism antagonistically in order to change them rather than agonistically basically assuming that there's still, there's a place in the market such as it exists for an alternative position. So informed by this political economic periodization, it makes sense why looking back on the history of critique within the discipline, we find precious few examples to follow actually. We have to ground our periodization in a deeper structural relationship between contradictions within the capitalist mode of production that in this case produce the precarity uh, in, the, in the academy and in the discipline. Uh, and I think after, especially after 2008, these contradictions become unmissable in a way that maybe they hadn't been unmissable for decades. They, they could be sort of ignored or theorized away from prior to that. Uh, so we need to uh, affect uh, a deeper structural relationship between these contradictions in the mode of production and contradictions within architecture. And I think it's this material historical context. And even as you say in the final, in the final answer to the interview at the end of the book, a grounding in political movements outside the discipline, which dialectically make the critique of architecture both necessary and possible. So I think, I hope that helps to maybe set some of the context. I uh, really appreciate your book very much and your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Will. Um, I'm curious to know whether our other two panelists share your your optimism. Um, so I'll I'll kick it to Ricardo. Right. Uh, possible, necessary, and inevitable. Although someone still got to do it. So thank you, Doug. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, I'll, I'll essentially talk about some ideas that, uh, kind of threads of thought that your book, uh, kind of triggered in my brain, I guess, um, not necessarily kind of asking any explicit questions. Um, but certainly, um, I must say that this book is a timely contribution <laughs> and, um, it's good to kind of be talking at the AA, even if virtually again, uh, since you like miserably abandoned us. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so yeah, it's very kind of heartening and does give us a sense of optimism. Okay, so I have two main thoughts. Um, I, I don't think I have time for both. Um, the first one is pretty, pretty big. The second one is smaller and I'll probably cut it and leave it for discussion afterwards. Um, so I'm gonna start with, a point where you, you describe yourself in the interview as sitting somewhat uncomfortably between being a Marxist and a Foucauldian, which I thought, thought was really kind of cute and nice. Um, but I do think that uh, the book is definitely much more affirming a kind of Marxist position. Uh, Foucault is barely present, either as a reference or conceptual framework for you, uh, or as a reference and conceptual framework for the objects of your critique. Um, and this is where I kind of want to, maybe unexpectedly, what I want to bring up a bit. Um, I can't help but feel that there is a kind of a specter of Foucault hovering over, especially maybe sections one and two of the book. Um, this is more striking in section two, critiquing, um, particularly or the, the part of it, critiquing Morelli and autonomous ideologies in architecture. Um, where the category of the archipelago is crucial. Uh, the archipelago appears as a kind of an additive product of objects, which are themselves achieved through essentially an ontological, agonistic, radical separation discourse coming from Carl Schmitt, uh, read as a kind of an ethical escapism from 
capitalist material conditions in the metropolis, right? Um, it is very hard for me to not see here also Foucault's argument for spatial heterotopias as affirmations of difference through spaces that are other than the dominant social forms, right? So, uh, and in Foucault, this is a positive proposal. Um, but so kind of merged together with something else in Foucault, his critique of the carceral archipelago. So kind of in a kind of sort of paradoxical and sort of evil dialectical kind of way. <laughs> um, the archipelago of exemplars can be read as ending up actually fusing both. It's a kind of a carceral heterotopic archipelago um, where the walls of the prison keeping the prisoner in are also agonistically keeping kind of capitalism out. Uh, and, um, and in fact, that, that's the whole idea. The, the possibility of escaping the hegemonic material conditions of capitalism in the urban resides in becoming an eth ethical prisoner of an agonistic heterotopic architecture, right? This is kind of your argument. Uh, this, this is kind of my argument on your argument, I guess. So this is section two. Um, but I feel this specter also in section one. Uh, and I, I think it's kind of popped in my brain as I was reading section two and sort of retroactively reading section one again, uh, especially in your use of the Pompidou Center. Um, and, and here I think I, I would link this to the broad kind of issue that you discuss of, of the base superstructure dialectic in Marxism, which I think I affirm more than you. I, I, I like talking about base and superstructure, uh, but I think the fundamental point is the dialectic and not the duality, right? Um, in some chapters, your critique flows very, very kind of clearly and explicitly between economic interests and its ideological framing, right? Uh, I, this is very clear in when you address Aurelius' reading of the Franciscans in the beginning of section two, or when you discuss uh, the Lisbon case study, for example, connected to the privatization of Portugal's energy sector and the use of cheap labor and telecommunications. Um, in the Pompidou bit, uh, you mostly address like the ideological, let's call it kind of side, and I know this is kind of crude, but to make it easier to get what I'm talking about. Um, so talk about the discourses framing this Deleuzean kind of architecture of individual flows. Uh, and you don't go so much into the political economy of the new forms of public investment that this architecture is kind of hinting at and that then become dominant. Uh, so I wanna push this Bayes side here, uh, running the risk of being accused of crudeness, but I think it's really useful uh, to kind of even like read how powerful your argument is. Um, you essentially kind of royally trash the Deleuzean rhetoric through the Pompidou uh, as uh, the neoliberal appropriation of 68 towards a kind of super abstract concept of freedom, I guess, um, where, and I think I'm going to quote you here, the state, particularly in its more overt and coercive actions, should absent itself from the stage in order to allow the free play of market forces to thrive and the entrepreneurial mentalities of its actors to flourish. So 68 kind of led in this direction, right? Uh, and I think this reading that you do is really, really exactly right and important. And actually like re a really important reading today of what has become the contemporary legacy of 68 and of like quote unquote radical culture, right? Something that we've talked about as well and kind of can discuss this radical culture and what radical means. Um, I'd like to add here that I think that there are also deep state stakes at the level of the um, political econo economic dimension of the transition from welfare state capitalism to neoliberalism on uh, that are announced by the Pompidou, uh, especially if we see the Pompidou as a kind of an early start of uh, Mitterrand's logic of the Grand Projet. Um, Mitterrand's Grand Projet is essentially building like 10 more Pompidou's all over Paris. I don't know if it's 10 or eight or whatever, something like that. Uh, so there's a library here, the opera there, uh, the uh, La Villette Park, uh, <laughs> key case study uh, exemplar of radical architecture over there, etc. 10 more Pompidou's um, all over Paris. Um, public investments, right, um, in the city, attempting to reorganize it in terms at the time announced as essentially kind of a return of public investment, apparently similar to the 
public sector welfare state logics that obviously Mitterrand Socialist Party at the time was kind of presenting itself as being a sort of revival of. Um, uh, in the Anglo world, the, 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 the this concept of the new left tends to be read obviously through uh, Clinton and Blair. But I think Mitterrand is kind of an important vanguard in this tendency and it is really useful for architecture to look at this because precisely because it's so kind of clear how our architecture is kind of important in it, like uh, the role of architecture in this whole thing is kind of embodied uh, in, in this grand projet logic as both superstructure and beds, right? Um, it is public investment, but is not as a, but is not a systemic planning of infrastructure. It is not public control over economic over economically strategic sectors. It is not strict regulation of finance. It is not public funding of universal free healthcare, education, and housing. All of these central characteristics of the capitalist welfare state, right, that are in decline at the time, and they're not really kind of substantially revived uh, by uh, the Mitterrand Socialist Party government. Um, but what we have is lots of public funding happening in the city in highly visible form in these urban projects, right? Um, and these uh, two things here. The public, uh, as this is happening, the public program and the paradigmatic architectural object that defines the discipline moves from the public housing estate to basically the museum or a cultural venue of any description always with a kind of monumental aspect and always infused with a kind of an aura of cultural democracy, democracy through participation, uh, usually linked to new avant-garde, flexible and flowy forms, all of the stuff that like, you perfectly describe in this chapter, like tackle head on, right? Uh, it is also a shift from the dominant mode of production of architecture itself, from large interdis interdisciplinary public offices where architects are unnamed public servants making housing in schools, to the artist, visionary, author, entrepreneur of this architecture era. So at, at this point, neoliberalism isn't just doing cuts in public spending in its early stages, right? Of neoliberalism. It's not just doing cuts in public spending. It is redirecting public spending away from forms of investment that decommodify entire sectors or significant chunks of sectors of the economy, like public housing did, uh, to instead re-commodify them. That's the project, that's the idea, the political economic project. And this is done by Mitterrand through the Grand Projet precisely as an archipelago of heterotopic Deleuzean islands, um, of which the Pompidou is a kind of a first prototype, um, which are all like large monumental objects affirming themselves as pluralistic democratic others against the hegemonic sea of the capitalist urban condition. And yet what these programs are actually doing is A, increasing the attractability of the specific city in the global market of cities, and B, directly increasing the land values of the surrounding areas for the private real estate sector that is at the time re beginning to replace the increasingly underfunded public housing sector, triggering what we today clearly identify as kind of Bilbao effect processes of gentrification. So the agonistic island of Schmidt and the infinite flows of the Luz are actually kind of historically joined together here um, as a kind of autonomous carceral heterotopic archipelago where the project of radical fluidity and the project of, project of radical agonistic separation are actually kind of the same project. The sea is also the island, um, simultaneously producing the literal real estate speculative boom that was until 2008 the central pillar of neoliberal financialization, and at the same time, producing the subjectivity where individual entrepreneurship and personal ethical refusal also become the same thing. Um, and see, here's kind of where I'm gonna end. Um, it seems to me that the tragedy of the contemporary condition kind of ending in the contemporary as Will just did, um, is that disciplinary discourses affirming themselves as alternatives to each other and to capitalism increasingly in the face of the current crisis have really kind of fully ended up being different from each other, mostly as discursive brands in an academic free marketplace of ideas. Uh, and Will just mentioned this kind of debate between Schumacher and Gage, which is what really, really funny. We, I think we watch it together. Uh, and we are like, yeah, go, go, Patrick. 
Um, he was just saying, it's the same thing. You're just saying the same thing we said 20 years ago. Uh, um, so, I mean, they, they are different in that sense. They construct themselves, but they, but they have a very hard time in being substantively different in any way that connects to the material transformation of the city and the territory in the middle of those stages of capitalism. Um, the difference, it feels to me, lies mostly in like each, each discourse emphasizing one specific different aspect of how architecture functions in neoliberalism. It kind of isolates one aspect from the rest of them and then fetishizes that aspect as a progressive or critical alternative to the rest of them. Um, you can read this as a kind of, a, I suppose we can and probably should even read this as a kind of archipelago in academia. Um, so when, to, to finalize, when discussing Bayesian superstructure, your book insists on the dialectic rather than duality. Obviously, I, I agree here. Um, and it seems clear that only the dialectical reading can, quoting, your, quoting you, quoting Tafuri, discover the secret of the magician's trick. Right? Uh, this trick is operative to capital, and here I'm bringing up operativity, I guess, myself. And that operativity imposes both contradiction and ambiguity on the discursive trick. To the point that the trick, at the level of ideological production, production of subjectivity, is increasingly how to best sell a certain form of cognitive dissonance as itself a critical project. Um, highlighting exactly, and here I finish, why today we need, as opposed to an architectural critique, and finishing, I, me, finishing my thing at the beginning of your book, uh, why, as opposed to an architectural critique, we need a critique of architecture. Um, to use the, your term, a critique that has an external reference that is subjecting architecture uh, to the... It, it, I suppose it kind of end with the question that it's, it's kind of implying that it's subjecting architecture to a higher subject, um, which means that the critique, of course, needs to be imminent, but, may, but it also needs to, at the same time, be external. And kind of end with that. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Rick. Um, and then last but not least, we've got Eleni, so go ahead. Um, hello, it is a, a great uh, pleasure to have uh, the opportunity to discuss this uh, important uh, uh, work by, uh, by Douglas. And thank you uh, very much for, for the invitation. Um, uh, as uh, I think one thing that we share with, uh, with Doug is uh, sitting uh, uncomfortably uh, between um, uh, uh, Marx and, uh, and Foucault. And, uh, and for this, I think I would try to I focus a bit on this aspect of the uh, production of the of subjectivity in uh, in the book. Um, um, I will try to keep it short, as I think uh, most of the uh, points, especially uh, uh, um, the main point, I think I, have, I want to, to make. It is partly covered by um, by Will's uh, position. Um, so uh, the book, I think, that does an excellent work in uh, developing uh, the critique of architecture as a necessary response uh, to the post-critical turn in architecture. And um, in this sense, I think there is a, a continuation to the, uh, to the challenge that was posed in the previous book, in the architecture of, uh, of neoliberalism. Uh, the critique of architecture opens up, though, the scope and addresses uh, both the discursive and theoretical truth games in which architecture is engaged, uh, but also analyzes the, the actual design and production of architectures and their effects uh, on the formation of subjects. Uh, and this is uh, one of the elements that I found especially interesting in how the book positions uh, architecture uh, uh, beyond, but, uh, between, but also beyond base and superstructure and proposes a dialectical relation between them. So architecture is formed by material conditions, uh, relations of production and ideology. And accordingly, uh, to book proposes that the book proposes that um, architecture should not be theorized as a mere representation or reflection of this. Uh, in this sense, the critique uh, that the book develops on uh, Guy Debord's uh, spectacle, on uh, Jameson's uh, transcoding and Adorno's phantasmagoria, I think they are very accurate. We have also uh, to admit, though, uh, that this task is not um, an easy task, the task of addressing the actual material conditions of the production of architecture and how this partake in the pro process of subjectification 
and the formation of ideologies. Uh, this is not an easy task, as one needs to uh, be very careful on how engages with allegories, uh, metaphors, uh, theories, and especially the discussion of, of form. Um, most importantly, this uh, requires awareness of the social and economic conditions within capitalism and the cost and presentation of architecture as a formative process uh, for the subject uh, that is determined by the dialectical relation between uh, a base and superstructure. I think the book does this work and it does it uh, really well. Uh, it examines architecture as a form of mediation. Uh, especially in the first part, uh, where it demonstrates the role that architecture and theory play in processes of, neoliber of, of uh, neoliberal subjectification. In uh, neoliberalism, um, uh, Homo economicus is an entrepreneur, uh, as entrepreneur that is, is for himself his own source of earning uh, within the liberal economic space. The exchange value of his products um, is related uh, to, the, um, to the perceived uh, uh, usefulness and the market uh, becomes the space of veridiction of this utility. So, uh, so as we know, in, uh, in uh, uh, mar uh, market neoliberalism is understood as, an, as a natural space of competition between enterprises. The pursuit of uh, individual profit and competition defines the individual and prescribes a universalized economic conception of human. Uh, the book demonstrates, I think, very well how certain architectures and, and discourses promote these entrepreneurial and competitive, competitive uh, practices and the belief in the uh, natural state of societies and, and markets. markets. Uh, this way, they support and sustain neoliberal ideologies. Uh, the conception of, uh, of man, naturalness, and fitness that emerged in, in the environment of the 1960s, uh, the new architectures of mass uh, circulation and leisure, and the architectures of uh, smooth, affective uh, learning spaces, which have uh, proliferated in the last uh, few decades, are employed in uh, neoliberal governance, as um, you very well uh, demonstrate. Uh, captured within this uh, architecture, subjects uh, are consumed by architecture uh, itself. Uh, they, uh, they lose any, um, uh, they are depoliticized and um, um, uh, they, they become another object of, of, of consumption uh, um, by architecture. So forms of participation and initiatives uh, within these spaces tend to become mere illustrations and the architecture um, uh, undermine is undermining any form of actual protest. Uh, I think uh, the book explains how in spaces in which we are to act as citizens, our participation becomes an animation uh, to be consumed. And in spaces that we are to develop knowledge and independent thought, uh, we are directed to form uh, enterprises and produce knowledge commodities instead. Um, the possibility for uh, an intervention becomes difficult as it is considered a totalitarian attempt uh, against the naturalness of society and the market. Uh, as the book demonstrates, certain architectures are compliant to this uh, creation of these spaces and rationalities of uh, social conduct. Conte uh, contemporary architectural practices and discourses mostly turn towards an affirmation of this uh, neoliberal uh, condition, uh, while they obscure the material conditions of uh, inequality and precariousness that are contained uh, within them. Um, the book addresses this um, implicit demand for architectural theory and uh, criticism to be always optimistic and propose solutions, no? Um, in opposition to this, one can suggest that in this series of essays, um, uh, you propose critique as, um, uh, as a work of praxis uh, towards radical disillusionment. Uh, however, one could claim that critique faces a serious predicament within neoliberalism, uh, since it can be consumed as another product of uh, intellectual uh, labor within the uh, knowledge market. Uh, this is briefly addressed, I think, at the end of the book, where it is stated that critique um, um, as another intellectual product uh, cannot avoid marketization, uh, but it can uh, contribute to the radical disillusionment of, of, of the profession. Um, Marx defines praxis as uh, action towards, uh, oriented towards uh, uh, changing society and uh, stresses uh, the primacy of praxis over theory, uh, claiming that theoretical contradictions can only be resolved uh, through uh, practical activity. So chains can be brought only uh, from the base uh, um, through the chains of, of material uh, conditions. 
Um, the text makes some references to this, as, uh, for example, in, in regard to the development of class awareness uh, to radical politicization. It addresses the employment conditions within the profession, uh, but also considers the material conditions, I think that's the most important, of how architecture is produced. Uh, so. Uh, I will end with a question. I was wondering how we are to consider, and I think that relates to uh, Will's point, how we are to consider the critique of architecture in relation to praxis and how uh, critique can be operative uh, towards the uh, activation of social changes within this uh, neoliberal uh, frame, which makes it uh, almost impossible. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, Eleni. I, I want to give... Um, Doug, a chance maybe to respond and then also remind people who are watching um, that you're free to pose questions in the chat um, and we'll um, we'll handle those as they come in. Yeah, so everybody think of your questions and I'll try and respond to like, a really welcome, but nevertheless a barrage like <laughs> frame of references. I think one of the main things that uh, um, in some way all of those comments and I thank you very much for them um, make me think about is is where we are now and the, um, so the, the reference I make to you know what what happens at the the kind of the juncture the turn into neoliberalism even before it's called that that you know that's why I've, this, that's the second time I've come back to the Pompidou Center I talk about it's like so the state then kind of distances itself and lets culture do this work. And it's it's interesting that at the Pompidou, it's in part modelled on the idea of the hypermarket and then the hypermarket takes on the role or, you know, consumerism and consumption and the abundance and choice it suggests kind of take on or, or come in place of welfare. And but it also makes me think then, if we take ourselves to a much more contemporary scenario, uh, this this past summer in, in the US of, and it's by no means unique, which is when we're not seeing the withdrawal of the state is like neoliberalism seems unable to budge. So the economic system, its operations seem kind of untranscendable, but in the face of them failing, um, and the exacerbated conditions of, uh, economic inequality and racial inequality and gender inequality, the state also then has to come in and be very visibly present um, in, you know, enforcing the notion that there is no alternative. Uh, and I'm also really struck, and it might sort of strike you as well, Marinella, of, of like people defending target, so defending essentially a hypermarket uh against black lives matter protests when well, you know, didn't need defending <laughs> black lives matter are not especially interested in it but there's there's something i i think perhaps kind of captured about our own time about the kind of you know the issues you're talking about were about you know periodizing understanding our own historical moment then more broadly yeah it is one where um yeah, the, the, the conditions, the, the conditions kind of imposed by neoliberalism are inescapable, you know, and as, as negative conditions for practically everyone. Um, we talk more specifically about architecture and uh, the academy. Um, well, yeah, I, I, I think that the, the development of the, the lobby um, and other similar groups elsewhere uh, is a very positive sign of, you know, where it does recognise the identity of architects as workers, but I think that there are also issues there too, to kind of pick up on a point that you were making, Eleni, about radical disillusionment. And I think that that should also be applied to people who understand themselves to be uh, radical architects. I think the the hardest illusion for architects to, to drop is that they are special because they have a, a special capacity to imagine the world differently and that they are kind of masters of space and that therefore one only needs to point one's um, 
intellectual abilities as uh, uh, an imagineer of, of the future in the right political direction, and then and then everything is right with the world. But it still leaves the the division between intellectual and manual labour entirely intact. Um, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention about the the kind of period we're in is just that in although it might seem like we've got some sort of reprieve in having Biden in in the US in place of Trump, it yes, it's better than Trump, um, but marginally and and to what degree is highly debatable. So the Republicans in Iowa, where I live, are at the moment in the process of trying to introduce legislation which will force everyone working in a university to make a statement on their political affiliations and beliefs and to make all teaching materials publicly available to inspection and that all universities will be bound to ensure that there is a balance between conservative and what they describe as liberal politics uh, across the, the faculty. Uh, so that's the kind of pressure we're under at the, at the moment um, in academia. And if it's happening in the US, don't rule out it happening elsewhere. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, you know, the, the, the period we're in is, is as always, with, with periods of crisis, and it's an overused term, but yeah, it's a period of optimism in terms of the, the older kind of softer solutions, the, the kind of fanciful romanticism of being a radical architect or practicing critical architecture are kind of increasingly self-evidently untenable. And therefore, we're kind of pushed, whether we like it or not, to, to really think about what um, being politically on the left might mean. Um, but we, you know, we live in, in dangerous times as well in that in that regard. Um, yeah, I think that's yeah. I mean, there's there's lots more I, I could say about, about that. I think the the only other point I want to make is um, perhaps in in response, especially to uh, Ricardo, your remarks about the island and the sea. I mean, I, I, on one level, I totally understand the, the notion of wanting to kind of isolate yourself from the network, from the, the sea of economic exchange. But that's just the condition that, that everyone is, is placed in. We're all trying to, you know, just getting a, a job or securing a job is trying to, you know, insulate yourself to some degree from insecurity. You know, in the US, getting a job means also trying to secure health care. So you're kind of like trying to secure your health. You're trying to secure your very life. So to try and anchor yourself is, is not just something that is like desirable. It's just the very condition of neoliberalism anyway. Um, so that there is really no way out in the existing conditions in terms of any type of individual or, or small scale project. And again, that's that's where the the kind of condition of, of danger lies. But yeah, I'm very happy to take any any questions or Marinella, I don't know if you had any thoughts or comments you want to chip in with. Yeah. So actually there's a, a couple of things. I'm glad you brought up the US context because we got a question actually from Manuel about how your own move or whether your own move from the UK to the US has influenced your argument. So I'd love to hear you talk about that. But then also, you know, as everyone was was talking, I was both, you know, struck by this idea that like, yes, there is, there is I think a pervasive sense that, you know, right, like that very well-known quote by now that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. And I think that that is, so deeply pervasive in in the architecture world, in in many ways because it because it does take so much capital to build at all, and so architects usually, in order to get their work built, have to occupy a position that is very very close in proximity to people who have actual real power. Um, and by by that I mean capital. But then 
so they, so, you know, architects end up thinking that they themselves have power when that is not the case at all. And so, so I think what you're talking about in terms of a, a critique that is, that fosters, or Elena, you were saying this, that fosters a kind of radicalizing, um, um, Oh my God, the word has exited my mind, but a, a kind of radicalizing critique is, is, is exactly right. And then that also made me want to inquire more, Doug, into your question about um, the, the danger territory, right? Because in many ways, it's like, okay, when workers, you know, at a factory go on strike, they know that they are um, not going to be paid in that time, right? Um, and yeah. in fact, their livelihood depends actually on their on their bosses that they're striking that they're striking on doing well, right? And so, in a lot of ways, the work of the you know of the critic, um, or of, you know even obviously many of us also depends on the institution of architecture, the institution of architecture criticism being able to be held together. And so, lobbying critiques at that is also in in an indirect way lobbying a, a kind of making put putting yourself in danger of being out of a job of or or um you know yeah. no longer being able to support yourself so anyway so um i wanted to hear you also say more about that element of danger and also welcome um comments from anyone else on that on that okay yeah wow so we moved to the u.s um yeah, I, <laughs> there's a lot I could say about that. I mean, again, in terms of academic experience, it's, um, uh, yeah, um, you're really kind of seeing capitalism in the world and the whole tenure system that I've never really understood why Americans are so kind of like, it's always thinking about tenure and why it's so important. And, and, and all it means is like, your job is made permanent. Like when, and I know we have, you know, there's a total abuse of temporary short term contracts in the UK. But that's just like the norm in in the US. Um, so the academic situation is even it's just like several degrees on from the, the kind of precarity, the neoliberalism uh, in, in the UK and, and from what I can grasp of, of Europe. I think what what has been inspiring in general about being in the US is that and what what I'm more conscious of now is, is to be a much longer term tradition is that the the activism and the organization against injustice is is much much stronger um, and more everyday level you know so I'm out here in the middle of the middle in a small to mid-sized US city, Des Moines, um, you know, and we have a, a mutual aid network that when people were in danger of freezing to death, um, when we had the, the polar vortex here a month ago, managed through its own efforts and its own fundraising efforts to get people into a hotel and save people's lives. But they do that kind of organizing work all the time um, and it seems to be something that's far more prevalent I think in, in the US and so I so I think it's perhaps because of the fact that if there is no one there to look after you you end up kind of looking out for yourselves and I see a bit more of that in the US than than in the UK um, yeah so um, and Marinella you were asking about the the danger of practicing critique. I mean, I, I have to say that I, it's no views word, but let me just say, you know, I do have tenure. I am in a privileged position, but therefore I, I think the, the onus is on anyone in that position like myself to go out there and name names. And like, it doesn't matter. I've got, I've got my job. You know, no one's going to take that away from me because I'm rude about another architect or another theorist. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> at the moment so i can do that not everyone can do that but and i know you are equally fearless marinella <laughs> in some of your recent contributions <laughs> um, yeah i i think it yeah it's it, the kind of onus is on people who, whose position is not precarious or less precarious 
to be more forthright in the critique and then establish that as not as not kind of um you know outside the norms of what might go on in academia or or from an academic context to to kind of insist on its on its place there and i also think that a lot of the what I might call the kind of liberal response within universities to acknowledge things like um, racial injustice can also be taken up and, and pushed further. And that, that's also a kind of challenge and an opportunity that can be taken up. Yeah, I'm curious to hear from from Rick or Will or, or Eleni your thoughts on this particular topic. Um because it seems to me like it's a where I at least I feel from for my own work like I'm sort of committed to it to this kind of a critique long term but also to a critique that is um allowing people to kind of come along with me as opposed to doing what like Eleni and Will both mentioned, which is like making a brand that like will rival and like edge out other brands. Um, so yeah, curious to hear from both of you. I have to say that I have found uh, a refugee in the uh, a refuge in the uh, history. Uh, so I think uh, I think doing historic historical research also it is uh, it is another way to doing you know to uh, finding ways to critique um, what's happening nowadays uh, but uh, by you know by finding evidence maybe it's not so much uh, um, uh, you know uh, timely but it, it I think you can you can somehow find material from the past and bring it back and um, and um, and this way somehow use history in, in, in such way. Uh, but um, uh, it is it is a really difficult condition, I think, and it is really difficult to um, uh, to, to escape it. And, and uh, uh, yeah, I don't want to be <laughs> negative. I'll let maybe uh, will. Uh, I have to be negative. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to start with a joke. Just uh, Doug, your description of the political uh, effects upon academia is pretty terrifying. But since uh, Republicans don't seem to be able to tell the difference between liberal centrists and communists, does that mean the state, manda state mandated Marxism in half of the university education? Yeah, it, it is a point because we did see something about what it might mean. And, it, and I've been asked also questions um, at my university you know, where you just asked, not not in terms of giving this information out, but just in terms of surveys, like where do you sit on the political uh, spectrum, you know, and the options are, you know, very liberal to uh, very conservative. It's like <laughs> the left does not exist there. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's a kind of stupid scheme, but I think it's, um, it is telling of, of what's coming. And, and they also want to... What, what might be likely to happen, and this is interesting as well, I think, as well as terrifying, is the removal of the tenure system altogether, which is not from, <laughs> not from a kind of radical bottom-up perspective where everyone gets permanent jobs. It's like no one has a permanent job. Um, and kind of running to our defence at Iowa State, we have um, some of the bigger agricultural um, firms because their their belief is that they want good well-trained employees coming from a university from public university um, who are taught by professors who are going to be there because they have or are going to get tenure so we have a strange scenario where big corporations are kind of defending a public university from the worst excesses of the the um the conservatives Right. There's all kinds of contradictions yeah. out there. Yeah. I mean, at the, at the AA, there's a there's a contradiction. I think this this question can only be addressed at the tactical level and how we deal with contradictions in institutions that we find. Um, so at the AA, which has a 
a pretty straightforward market model for its units and diploma history and theory courses. Uh, there is a large market for this sort of intransigent critique. Uh, I think because of the uh, concrete interests of students, especially design students. And I think there's a, a, another interesting question in the interview is around the split between intellectual um, critical labor and technical skills-based labor. Okay. And I think that uh, that contradiction is paradoxical, I think, politically in some ways, where students interested in a more straightforward conservative practice of architecture uh, are often more uh, interested in a powerful critique of the discipline as it's uh, developed in the last decades. Yeah. So the AA, uh, which uh, you know we we think of as a as an elite privileged institution, uh, despite obviously the precarity that exists within it, uh, creates interesting kind of contradictory opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. This is what I was going to talk about as well. Um, First of all, I, I to just make a kind of a little comment on this whole like political spectrum liberal to conservative question, like question that they ask you. I, I, I heard this some time ago and I found it really funny. It's like there's five possible political positions, right? There's like very liberal, liberal, moderate, conservative, very conservative. <laughs> Those are the five yeah. political positions in the United States. Um, I mean, of course. It, it, it's kind of, I mean, I, I don't know what I would reply. Uh, I think I would say moderate or possibly conservative. I would certainly not say liberal. <laughs> um, uh, but the, um, the um, it, it kind of goes to illustrate uh, how really kind of categories only really, really exist within uh, a critical uh, explanatory framework. <laughs> to kind of go back to critique, right? Um, critique means that you're transforming the framework, that you're uh, working through the material uh, that is given and transforming the very mechanism of reading it. Uh, you are not taking simply taking a position in an existing kind of barricade, you are constructing a new barricade. You're changing the direction of it. You're kind of fundamentally transforming um, the way in which the field is conceptualized and therefore a critique of architecture like just like political critique or critique of political economy, just like the critique of political economy makes the left to right uh, spectrum such as it exists in, in the, in the and as it is understood in mainstream political discourse today explode because it just doesn't work when you actually may have a structural understanding of uh, how the uh, how, how, of the real mechanisms, both base and superstructure, right? Um, there's no la left to right uh, spectrum in Marx. Um, <laughs> uh, just as critique of political economy makes the spectrum explodes, critique of architecture makes the categories and concepts and even the concept of architecture itself, such as we have it established uh, in the contemporary moment, also kind of explode. Right? It doesn't function in the same way. Um, and I think that is why, what, why to a significant extent, a kind of the intransigent critique position is becoming increasingly attractive um, in the current, uh, under the current material transformations. And I will mention this in his first uh, presentation and also now again. We really do feel that there is a kind of a systematic tendency to be more interested uh, amongst, in, in our direct empirical experience with working with students on these types of positions. And now we, we can kind of discuss then how, like, how do you avoid them just again, becoming a brand? Because all that we're saying is that uh, the type of product that we're selling in the, in the intellectual market is becoming more popular. Um, why are you not just another brand? Um, and this is complicated. It's a complicated question to answer because obviously we also are, uh, and we can't avoid being. So. Uh, I, I, I really liked your answer, Doug, to this question in the interview because it was really kind of just matter-of-factly and dispassionately saying, yes, but that's fine. And uh, um, we shouldn't have kind of a consumer ethics kind of panic about collaborating with the system. Because, uh, the working class that can't 
have a kind of an uh, 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 an ethics position of refusing to cooperate with capitalism. That just means go starve. <laughs> like if you're yeah. working, you're cooperating with capitalism. <laughs> Um, that's why you're the working class. <laughs> you have no choice. Um, and uh, obviously, we, we we are dealing with the same problem. And but also, I mean, this this is not a new problem. This is an old problem in 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 the uh, revolutionary left. Uh, like the reason we call communism communism, uh, and we associated the category of the term communism with the category that we associate with Marx and Engels is because when they were writing the communist, the manifesto of the communist party, they consciously decided to call it communism to separate as a branding effort, to separate it from the kind of sea of socialisms that existed at the time. Uh, so it, it, the communism was understood as being kind of, you said communism and socialism were essentially synonyms. Uh, in the early 19th century, um, but they chose this less used word to make to, to construct a marketing brand <laughs> difference, mm. um, and that's all fine. Uh, I mean, as Lenin also said, capitalism will sell us the rope with which we'll hang it. Um, you, so you are working within the framework. There, there's a distinction between the kind of working within and against capitalism in the autonomous sense and working within and against capitalism in a Marxist sense, right? Um, you understand that you're part of the uh, market dynamics and you don't get to find an island out of it. And what you get to do is exploit its contradictions. And in every single crack that you see, you like to try and punch it. Yeah. Uh, and see what happens. Um, and there's lots of cracks now and you're punching them. And if that, and, and, and in some, sometimes that means you're creating a branding exercise for yourself as a, opposite to existing trends. Um, that does not necessarily automatically mean that you're just another brand, but it also does mean that you need to be self-conscious that you are one. Yeah. Well, that would take us, I mean, I think Marinella, you want to make, and because of the time that I should make some concluding remarks. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, um, probably not the time to introduce, introduce in concluding remarks, but to make it even more complicated, this is why um, Pierre Bourdieu is so important to what I do, because he is, you know, he's such a fantastic critic of so much other uh, theorising and intellectual culture that goes on in the time that he's doing much of his work. And one of his sort of founding points is to, is to acknowledge your own position within the intellectual culture that you're contributing to, to acknowledge your own position um, and, and take the, the reflexivity all, all the way. So you reflect on where you are too. And I, I think we're all um, trying to do that in one way or another. Um, I've had some further questions come up that there isn't time to answer, but Sean, we should discuss Michael Hopkins and the Jubilee line further. Seriously, I want to do that. Um, um, yeah, so what I, you know, where I would say this book sits is, um, is, is the best I can come up with at the moment. And it is just kind of putting it out there for other responses and then we'll, we'll build on this. Um, the, the, the people who've joined me um, here, the people I've worked with before, and, and going forward, we can carry the, these questions forward between us. So I hope that this book is some, in some way useful contribution to uh, what is, I was going to use the word project there, but we have to be careful about that. Let's say an, an endeavour <laughs> that we're all engaged with here. So. Um, Thank you very, very much, all of you, for, for coming to see this. I, I really feel um, very appreciative of how many people have, have turned up to watch this, um, and especially to, to Will, Rick, Eleni, and Marinella. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doug. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Can I make a final plug? Yeah. Just that uh, Doug's going to come back to the AA and Marianella as well for a symposium on May 7th uh, that's going to pick up on a lot of these themes. The symposium is called Radical Reform Revolution. <laughs>
architecture and liberation. So hopefully see everyone back then. Like a James Bond film. <laughs> I will be back in radical reform revolution. So I will see you then. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Doug. The book, first of all. <laughs> Thank you.